All right, well, um, let me uh, kind of move us toward the beginning of, of things here. Um, and uh, the psalm that we're opening the service with is uh, Psalm 107. And for some reason, I just <laughs> lost my prisoner mode. That is okay. We will deal without it. Um, uh, this is Psalm 107. And I want to alert everybody uh, to something that I, I want you to be thinking about and praying about and think, uh, thinking and praying about throughout the service. Um, there's, I want to alert you to the theme uh, of things kind of early. So in each of the scriptural readings that we're going to be doing, uh, you are going to be seeing something about waves and wind and storms. Um, and it might be a minor theme. It might be one moment, one detail in the bigger scripture. Um, it, or it might be a bigger part of the scripture. But each of the scriptures we read are going to have something about that. And so pay attention to that theme because uh, that will, that will uh, frame the whole service for us. Uh, and it'll frame the um, it'll frame the sermon as well. So look for the storm, uh, look for the waves, look for the chaos, and what God says into that chaos, and what God does in the midst of it. Uh, it will show up here uh, in these verses taken from Psalm 107. Uh, and I wonder uh, who might want to read this psalm uh, for us. I will. All right, Linda, please uh, please read for us, sister. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, from north and south. Come on, buddy. Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless. Hungry and thirsty, they nearly died. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight into safety, to a city where they could live. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some were fools. They rebelled and suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food, and they were knocking on death's door. <clears throat> Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love, for all the wonderful things he has done. Some went off to sea in ships, playing the trades roots of the world, plying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke and his, the winds rose, stirring up the waves. The ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged down again to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wits end. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. Amen. Amen. You'll notice there, you know, and, and, and there's more to that psalm. You can go back and read the whole psalm. There's several other stanzas where people get into various sorts of trouble. And sometimes the trouble is their own fault. Remember, one of the stanzas that we were just reading said uh, some people, you know, rebelled and fell into trouble because of their own sins. And when they cried, Lord, help, he helped. Whether the trouble comes because we make it for ourselves, whether the trouble comes because life is hard, people cry out, and God comes, and God helps. Well, that will be a theme for us. Um, uh, in this service. Farmers. 
true because it's part of what scripture tells us. Now we're going to do what the end of that psalm tells us to do. We're going to praise God together, and we're going to do that um, uh, by singing the doxology. And since we're all virtual, all of us can belt it. I like doing this because I like to belt this, and I love it uh, because um, Kay leads us, <laughs> and, and she has an ear that I don't, and so I just match my voice to hers, and, uh, and I can sing it with that help. So um, everybody else, make sure you're muted. I'm going to mute uh, myself. Uh, but Kay, uh, you're unmuted, I can see, and, and you lead us in singing the doxology. Um, let's go up a little higher. Boom, boom. Praise God. Oh, pardon me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 We can continue to praise him now uh, with this uh, next song, a contemporary version of an, uh, of an old song, a blessed one, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Uh, sing this in your home uh, together with your brothers and sisters, uh, and uh, let's enjoy the presence of God even as we praise him for the assurances he gives us. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. This is my song, raising 
His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my song. is um well if it'll let me move forward here mm -hmm. hold on one second we'll fix that um that is our story brothers and sisters um even in the midst of uh difficulty and crud um one of the cool things that Jesus has done for us is he's let us know the end of our story at the beginning. Um, he's let us know how he is going to make sure things wrap up because he is faithful and he is good and he is powerful. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's make it back in here. This, this, okay. Hopefully you're seeing what you should again. <laughs> um, let's take a moment and uh, pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for um, the assurance, Lord, that no matter what kind of difficulty, no matter what kind of pain, no matter our own failures and struggles, that you will be faithful, you will remain faithful, and that you will see us through, that you will be get, uh, that you will complete the good work that you've begun in us, Lord. Um, we pray uh, that you would take the time that we are going to spend together in the coming hour, and that Lord, um, you would use it powerfully to help us, to nurture us, to to grow us spiritually, uh, to guide us, to comfort us, to to um, Lord, to confront us where, where we might need some confronting, to, um, to strengthen us where we've grown weak, um, to draw our hearts back to you where, where they've been wandering, to capture again our imaginations, uh, to focus our love. Lord, um, we give this time to you and we pray um, that it would bear fruit in our lives this time we spend together with each other in your presence. We love you, Lord. We ask for the grace to love you better, to walk with you more closely, um, to walk more obediently. We pray all these things, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. All right. Um, so just a few announcements today, not a ton. Um, we are still doing lunch. And Susan, you can tell if you see her little box on your screen is there in the kitchen. Uh, with the oven because it's on. We, we've got a hot lunch today. It's a, like spaghettis and meatball, uh, spaghetti and meatballs, and uh, some other goodies, um, all uh, from our friends with the Food for the Journey project. Uh, so uh, that partnership is cool, and 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 uh, and they're helping us out sometimes with stuff on Sundays, and it's really nice. Um, so come, it'll be good food, uh, and you can get that, and you can take for your whole family if you need to. Um, and, and that'll be served pretty much regular time, 1245 at the church. Uh, website's such a great tool. And um, not only are there pictures up there that are new from the last few weeks that Susan's got up, Susan's also got up there a link um, to where you can give online. Um, that's kind of become a very practical solution for some of us, uh, especially under these conditions where we're not uh, together in person. So if that's something that God has led you to do and, and you have the ability to give financially, um, there's now a way to do that online. Um, 
at least giving to the uh, the half of our ministry together that's called the shepherd's table. Um, uh, if you are uh, somebody uh, who gives into the fund that belongs to the East Dayton Church of the Brethren, uh, then that still is something that you're going to want to be sending checks to Kay at her address that will be made available uh, as we always do on a slide at the end of the service. And if that's confusing to you, if you're like, wait, Shepherd's Table, East Dayton Church of the Brethren, what's the difference? Don't worry about it. Come talk to me or Susan later and, and we'll explain it all. Um, but some of you uh, who have longer histories with the church will know that difference and, and know where to give and, and that's fine. Um, the church is not closed today due to COVID, uh, ironically, uh, but, uh, but because we're still in COVID times and because many of us do uh, attend online and maybe can only attend online, the lack of internet at the church today, that was the problem. Uh, meant that if we did the service there, nobody else would be able to see it online. And we wanted to do it in a way that anybody could get, get to it and could be part of it. So, so we had to cancel because of lack of internet, which, boy, <laughs> snow days were a thing even for churches in the past. You know, okay, it's too icy. We got to cancel. Uh, canceling in person because there's not internet is a new one on me. That's never happened before. Um, but, but we didn't cancel, right? We switched back to this online modality. Um, and hopefully this, for this reason, is just a one Sunday thing and Spectrum will get their, get their stuff worked out. Um, and God willing, we're not going to have to cancel for COVID again. Hopefully the numbers keep getting better and they have been getting better. Um, and we can just keep praying for those numbers to keep getting better. Okay, um, this coming week, uh, there uh, is going to be a small group meeting on Thursday at the church at 7. That's the group that's meeting twice a month that Guy and Jenny are leading. Uh, and then the week after that, Tuesday, February 16th, Susan's group will be meeting. Um, and uh, so you have an opportunity this week and next uh, to come to the church midweek in a COVID safe way. Uh, people mask up and we're able to keep some social distance there, um, but still get fellowship, in-person fellowship and in-person Bible study and prayer. And so please reach out, uh, come to either of those. Uh, they're, they're really encouraging times. Um, and so, so that's available to you this week and next. And um, uh, Food for the Journey is going to be there Friday. Uh, some of you will know we put up a message that they, they had to cancel their service last Friday. Um, again, due to somebody testing positive in their volunteer pool who was not there during our day, during Friday, but was part of their Wednesday volunteer team. And to be extra safe, though, they, they canceled service throughout the week at their various locations. But they uh, have, uh, there have been no further positive tests. Everything's checked out. Um, and so they'll be back serving food on Friday. Um, I would want to add something here uh, for you guys to know and for you to let other people know. Not only are we ourselves as a church collecting and giving out uh, clothing items, but Food for the Journey is joining us in that and making sure that we have certain items like hats and socks and gloves, um, bags of non-perishable food items. Um, and those are not only available on Fridays at this time, but um, we've got a nice accessible stash for like Sunday today, where if somebody, and it's cold out, and guys, this coming week, for our friends who are homeless, uh, there are some days expected to have the low down. I saw negative 10 as a, as a prediction for one of those days. So we have hats and gloves and socks uh, available. We've got scarves. Uh, we've got blankets, actually, as well. Um, uh, that uh, And so so let people know like even if you just meet somebody on the street or it's somebody you know from the neighborhood long standing let people know we have these things and they can get them on fridays and on sundays uh for, from us um we do always welcome further donations and help uh because as the ministry expands and we're able to do more on fridays it's work to set everything up uh, and it'll probably be cold work on friday um so we will keep an eye on that if it's like dangerously cold, then we'll make a call of some sort um, and uh, and we'll see. But, but we'd alert you via one call about anything that changes like that midweek. Um, okay, so unless there's an announcement I'm forgetting, and somebody can alert me to that if that's the case, uh, but I don't think so. It's a relatively quiet week. Uh, that Those are our announcements. Um, on screen, you see um, an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a photograph. Uh, of stars and of actually galaxies. The brighter lights are galaxies, whole galaxies of stars shining through um, what is a nebula. A lot of space is full of 
gas clouds, gas clouds that are sometimes bigger than solar systems that are full of light from the stars that shine in them and around them. If you ever want to do something fun uh, in an afternoon, just go to NASA's website. They have a gallery of thousands and thousands of photos of the universe. It's pretty awe-inspiring. And the stars, as well as the sea and the waves and the wind, show up in this next reading from the book of Job. So let's, uh, I'll read this one. This is from Job 38, 1 through uh, 11. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness? For I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no farther will you come. Here, your proud waves must stop. The ocean, which ancient Israel lived right by, right? Israel's right on the sea shore. Uh, uh, there's no part of Israel that's more than a few tens of miles from the Mediterranean Ocean. And the ocean is always, even now, a very dangerous place to be. Even with modern ships, it's scary. And there are lots of ships that go down today on the ocean. And it was for the ancient peoples a symbol of great fear and worry of something so vast and powerful. It just made your knees tremble to think about you, tiny little you on a tiny little stick of wood out on the middle of that ocean, right? And what God says to Job in this passage, right, is um, I'm the one who draws boundaries even for the ocean, who stills its waves, who contains, who maintains, who calls the shots even for it. He is mighty and he is good. And we'll keep up with these themes throughout our time. Um, the, the sermon is going to be on, uh, oh, I don't know why this doesn't wanna play nice sometimes. The sermon's on uh, Mark chapter 4. We're ultimately going to be in verses 35 to 41. It's a short little passage. It is the passage where Jesus calms the storm at sea, in case that you couldn't already tell that that's where we were going. Um, that is where we're going. But I do want to mention very briefly, we're not going to spend long on this, but I want to mention the uh, material that comes right before the account of Jesus stilling the storm. Because in some interesting ways, they are connected. In ways maybe that aren't immediately apparent to you if, if, if you're not reading all of it all at once. Um, so right before the passage that we're going to spend most of our time on, Jesus is by the shore of the sea. And he's teaching. And he gets on the sea later, and we'll see that. But, but he's on the shore, and he's teaching. And he tells four parables. Very briefly, I'm not going to re go through all these things, but just so they're in your head. Um, the first parable he tells in chapter four is the parable of the seed and the soils, right? Farmer goes out, scatters seed on the road, uh, on the rocky soil that's shallow, um, on the weedy soil that has all the thorns in it, and on the good soil, right? And the point of that is that God gives his word to us, 
Uh, he gives it to everybody. He, he's not stingy with it. He throws it all over the place. But only some people take that word in in a way that produces fruit. The next parable is the parable of the lamp and the light. And it's this idea that if we're not looking at the world the way God looks at it, if we're not seeing things from God's perspective, if we're kind of looking from our own perspective instead of from God's perspective, then we are lost in the dark. The eye is the lamp of the body, and if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? That's Jesus' line there. We need to be looking through Jesus' eyes, through Jesus' goggles at the world, or we'll just be lost. The next parable, three of the four are about seeds, by the way. The next parable is the secret of the seed. That, uh, that you know, you go out, if you're a farmer, and you sow your seed in the morning, uh, and then you don't see it for a long time. <laughs> it's just like, is anything happening? Right? It's just there in the dirt. And it, it's dirt. You know, it's dirty. It's grubby. It's, uh, there's no sign of life until one day, weeks, maybe months later, this little green thing pokes its head up. And it wasn't there the morning before, but it is there that morning. And that thing grows pretty quickly once it reaches the surface into a full plant. And Jesus says the kingdom's like that, right? That, that the kingdom of God is sown and it goes in somewhere secret inside and it, it grows, it germinates, it gestates, and you can't see it working for a long time maybe, but then one day there it is. There's that little green shoot, that evidence that indeed it was there and indeed it is working. And then he tells, finally, the parable, the famous parable of the mustard seed, right? Another seed parable. And that the, that's the way God's kingdom works, is it's really teeny. And it looks very insignificant. Like, what, this is, this ain't going to do nothing. It's a teeny little mustard seed. And what turns out to be true is that that little mustard seed is going to produce the biggest plant in the garden. Now, you can actually see in all three of the seed parables a connection to the light parable, right? Looked at with dumb old regular human logic, the mustard seed doesn't look impressive. But if you know what God knows, if you know what God's trying to tell you, if you look at things God's way, then you know that mustard seed's the most important thing of all. And it makes a big difference whether you're looking at things God's way or not. Those themes, the themes of the hidden seed, the themes of looking at things God's way, they will connect in an interesting way to our main passage for the day. So let's read that together. Uh, I'm going to be reading the whole thing because it's not long, and then we'll go back and talk about it. This is Mark uh, chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, immediately following these four parables that were preached on the sea shore. Now we're going to get on the sea, starting at verse 35. I don't have the text on screen. I'm just going to read it so you can just listen. Or obviously, it's great if you have your Bible and can follow along. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon... A fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're drowning? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked the disciples, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples 
were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. Well, let's talk for a minute about the situation the disciples are in as this story gets underway. What's their situation? It's not a good one. <laughs> They're lost in the dark of night. You know, the, the Sea of Galilee is not that big. Um, it's not like, don't even think Great Lake big. It's, it's not humongous. It's certainly big enough, though, that if you're in a storm, if you're in the, with no, with cloud cover, you know, and you can't see the stars, you can't navigate that way, and you can't see the surrounding terrain, well, you're just in the inky black on a body of water that is definitely big enough to kill you, and you don't know which way is which, and um, that's pretty scary. You know, I, I, uh, I uh, was out on a boat a few different times as a teenager as part of youth trip events. And I remember one time uh, we went out at night and uh, it wasn't, it was, it was clear even. There was starlight, you know, you could see okay. But even being in a modern like speedboat type situation, when you're on the water at night, it's a, uh, you feel a little bit vulnerable. Well, this is beyond vulnerable. This is scary territory. Lost in the dark at night. But on top of that, they're exhausted. We know that they have been with Jesus all day with the crowds. And the crowds showed up again, didn't they? There, we, That's a theme in these sermons on Mark. Uh, but they've been with the crowds all day. And, and man, is that exhausting. There are parallel accounts to this one in the other Gospels that tell us more about this same day. And um, in them, we, we learn just how exhausting of a day it was. Um, they, they are absolutely bone tired. So not only are they lost in the dark at night, but they don't have the mental or emotional reserve to handle that, right? They are, they are tired. They are tired people. And it, I kind of already mentioned this, but they're on the sea. It's not like, it'd be one thing to be lost in dark at, on land. That's scary, right? But you know what? You can kind of plunk yourself down and say, okay, let me build a little fire uh, and just wait this out. The sun will rise. I'll get to see where I am. You can afford to do that on land. They're in a little boat on the sea. They, they don't have that option. They're surrounded by danger. They're floating on, the, on a source of trouble. And they're not just lost in the dark on the ocean while exhausted, on the sea while exhausted, there's also a storm. On top of all that, it's a storm that's hit them. And not a little storm. The kind that makes waves taller than their boat. So tall that the waves fall into the boat and clog up their own noses and mouths with cold water that shocks the breath out of them. And it threatens to sink that boat just by filling it so full of water it can't even stay atop the water any longer. That's a scary situation. And Jesus is sleeping through it. Have you ever felt like Jesus went to sleep on you? <laughs> Where you're like, hey, Jesus, like there's giant waves in my life. And it's dark, and I'm scared, and I'm tired, and these problems are a lot bigger than me, and you seem to be asleep somewhere else. I need help, Jesus. Help me. Why aren't you helping me? Right? That's what these guys are experiencing. That's what they're feeling. That's their situation. So what do they do? How do they react to that situation? Well, they react the way we all react, probably, with terror. Um, that's the word that gets used later in the passage towards the end. They were terrified. 
we know what terror does to us. When we're scared, we do dumb things. Oh my goodness, the dumb things we do when we're afraid. We say things, we make decisions. They talk about the, the fight or flight response. I've talked about it before in sermons. Yeah, when you're scared, you, you lash out or you run away. Man, do we make bad decisions when we're scared and, and they're scared, they're, they're terrified. And, and they go to Jesus to wake him up. <laughs> what, why are you asleep? What, what are you doing? And they, they shake him and they yell at him. And, and, and it's not just that they're terrified and shaking him and yelling at him, but what they yell at them is this. Don't you care that we're drowning? Don't you care, Jesus, that I'm in trouble, that I'm stuck, that I'm hurt, that I'm, don't you care? They're afraid he doesn't. Isn't that interesting that that's what comes to their lips here? It's not just a simple cry for help. It's, it's not just a sort of confusion. The thing that maybe scares them more than anything else, the thing that, that maybe is most terrifying is that maybe he doesn't care. They're worried about that. What does Jesus do? Well, he wakes up as they shake him. And he looks around after he wakes up and short, simple, and sweet. Mark loves to tell it. Short, simple, and sweet. He doesn't give us all a lot of detail, but what he tells us matters. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence. Be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. The thing that Jesus says, the only words he utters so far in the story, silence be still, he says it to the, to the, to the sea, to the storm. And um, that's an okay translation. Um, here's an alternate translation um, in particular that gets the second command even better, I think. Uh, be calm or silence. The second one uh, is a word that literally means shut your mouth. Jesus, Jesus tells the storm, shut your mouth. It's, it, there's very much a feeling, and this is a word that's used in this way, of like, this is what like a parent says to a kid who's, who's out of control. And Jesus says it to the sea. Like, like the sea is like an out of control toddler throwing a tantrum, like, shut your mouth. Be calm. Shut your mouth. Jesus says to the storm, and, uh, oops, and, and, it, and it does it, right? Um, the storm is calm. The storm does shut its mouth. I, I don't know if you've uh, ever, I'm sure you have. You've either used this voice yourself if you're a parent, or you have had it used on you by your parents. But you know, mom and dad voice, you know, dad voice, mom voice, that, that parents have this thing I think Beck and I are going to have to work on developing it because we, we, we haven't had too many opportunities yet uh, to use it. Um, but it's, it's like this voice that I remember getting my dad uh, using this voice on me a couple times where you're doing something you really shouldn't. You know, think like playing by the street and you don't see there's a car barreling down towards you or whatever. And, and my dad would shout in this particular voice. It was a voice of command. And it was stern. <laughs> And it had a way, even if I was kind of in an out of control moment, man, you'd snap too and look over at because because that voice it had something in it that tells you you need to listen. And Jesus used that voice on the storm at sea, and it snapped too. The waves, the wind, the rain, the whole thing did. They snapped too to listen to the voice of command from Jesus to be still to stop it to give Peter and James and John a moment to breathe. But then, but then Jesus turns to them. And see, here we, we're going to see a shift in perspective. 
because he, he, he turns to them to ask them some questions. He turns to them um, to, to share a different perspective on their situation. He, he turns to them and he asks them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And of course, they might want to say to Jesus, in fact, I want to say to Jesus, what do you mean? Why am I afraid? What, what do you not understand about the situation, Jesus? It's dark and we're lost and there's a storm. What do you mean? Why am I afraid? But Jesus is, go, is looking at everything, looking at their whole situation from a totally different perspective. You see, that is what faith is. In the parable that Jesus told them that day, just earlier the same day before they got on the, the boat, Jesus said, well, look, faith, the, 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 your eye is the lamp of your body, right? You've got to look at things God's way. It's a very different way of looking at the world. It looks at a mustard seed and says, that's the most important thing in the world. And faith can look at a storm that's swamping your boat and can say, this is the perfect time for a nap. Huh. Jesus thought that was a perfect time for a nap. I sure wouldn't, but he did. Can I learn to see things the way he does? What does Jesus see that I don't? Why does Jesus think that this is time for a nap? How can I learn to see the storm the way Jesus does? Well, let's go back to a slide I showed just a moment ago. The disciples' situation, right? We were talking about that. They're lost in the dark. They're exhausted. They're at sea. They're in a storm. And to boot, and to boot Jesus is asleep. What the heck? Jesus, why are you asleep on the job? Well, can we learn to see this a little differently? Why does Jesus think it's okay to take a nap right now? Well, first of all, wait a minute. Let's take a step back and think about this. Jesus is with them in the storm. He's not somewhere else. He's not far away. He's not unavailable. Jesus is in the boat with them. And that fact should not be overlooked. Okay, the storm is real and it's not stopping. And Jesus is not yet stopping the storm. But he's not far away. He's with you in the boat. And that fact maybe looks only like a mustard seed, right? That's a little fact, but it turns out to be a very important fact that Jesus is with us when the waves are hitting us. Very important fact. That fact should frame our view far more than the size of the waves. You know, the disciples, if they had wanted to, if they had absorbed a little more deeply, maybe a lot more deeply, just who Jesus is, they probably could have laid down in that boat right beside Jesus and taken a nap with him. Maybe that's what he was doing saying, I'm in this with you, and it's okay to lay down, to stop bailing, to stop screaming, to stop paddling furiously. You ain't going to do nothing with that stuff. This storm's a lot bigger than you are, but you've seen me heal paralytics, raise the dead, the storm is nothing to me. Just lay down and take a nap. Lay back and rest. I'm here with you. And that's enough. Jesus himself is the seed hidden within the dark soil of this storm. And you don't see that seed working at first, right? Remember that, that parable that Jesus told, right? There's a long time where when that seed goes in the earth, it, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. And yet you wait those few weeks, those months, and the green shoot shoots up 
and oh my goodness, it was active. It was doing things, but you couldn't see it. What well, Jesus is in that boat with them, and they are not going to go down. Jesus is in that boat with them, and they are not alone. And if they want to, if they could, if they can summon the faith, they could just go ahead and nap themselves. They don't need to worry about it because Jesus is there. So yeah, they're lost in the dark and they're exhausted and they're on the sea and there's a storm and Jesus is asleep. But he's there and they won't go down. And he will help. The disciples have an opportunity to learn something in this passage. And that's framed by, by what Jesus tells them there, right? Now, do the disciples learn well? Well, the disciples are like us. <laughs> we're, we're disciples too. We're, we're co-disciples with Peter and James and John. We're part of the same story. And, uh, and after Jesus says, hey, why are you afraid? Um, don't, don't you have faith yet? The, literally the next line after he says is, why are you still afraid? The next line is, and they were terrified. <laughs> right? they're, still, they're still terrified. Um, and they ask, now this is interesting. They ask, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. It, it, it takes a while to sink in. You know, I think it takes a lifetime to fully sink in who Jesus is. It takes a lifetime to retrain your mind, to retrain the lamp of your eye, to look at things from God's perspective. Because when you're in the storm, every fiber of your being cries out, danger, danger, danger. Everything about what you can see with your physical eyes tells you this is it. There's no hope. There's no path out. There's no remedy. There's no solution. Everything about what you can see from your fleshly point of view tells you those things. But what you can learn to see, what Jesus wants you to see, is that his presence makes the difference. That even if he's asleep in the boat, the fact that he's in the boat means you will not go down. I mean, he can walk on water. He carried Peter back into the boat on another occasion when he started to sink. But man, oh man, is it hard to remember that truth. Man, oh man, is it hard not to be scared. Not to be terrified when the waves are that tall. The disciples don't see clearly yet in this story. They're not looking at it God's way. Just as we often don't. Just as we often can't. We don't, we don't see it. If you can come to see it Jesus' way even a little bit, then it grants you the ability to rest in the midst of the storm. You know, I, I, I do terrible with this. And then sometimes by grace and by grace alone, I have those moments even in my storms where I kind of go, oh yeah, hold on, I've seen this. And I'm not going to panic. I'm, I, 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 you know what, I, I'm just going to take a moment. I'm going to take a breath. I'm going to rest. Because God's got this. And that's what Jesus wants for us. Is to learn to rest in the storm. And you know, it's okay to wake Jesus up. It's okay to go to him in the storm and, and to yell even. And to cry out. And to say, Jesus, do something. But you know, it makes a big difference to us. Not necessarily to him, but it, it makes a big difference for us. It's, it's better for us if we go to Jesus full of the confidence of faith than with that terror. But whether you go terrified or full of the confidence of faith, do you notice that Jesus still responds? He does 
care. The disciples said, don't you care that we're drowning? And Jesus woke up and stilled the storm, even though they had no faith, even though they were terrified. And so whether you're terrified or whether you're full of confidence, it is a good idea to pray, right? That, what did they do? They went to Jesus and they shook him and they held on to him and they said, please do something. That's great. I'm just saying it's better if we can learn to pray with confidence, if we can learn to pray from a posture of rest that says, yeah, 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 I know he's got this. And maybe the seed's germinating and I sure wish a green shoot would show up, but but. I know my Lord's at work. I know he's in this boat with me. And so I know I am safe. I know I will come through this. When we go to him, he will, in time, still the storm. And he will turn to you and to me and ask those questions of us. He'll say, are, are you still afraid? Don't you see I'm here? Don't you see I'm with you? He'll still it and he'll teach us. Here are the, the truths we need to know. I'm repeating them a lot because this is a simple story and its message is pretty simple. And, and so I'm sorry for the repetition, but I'm also kind of not. Here's what we need to know. He is with you. You need to know that. He's with you in the boat. And he is not scared. In fact, Jesus knows that even in the storm, if he's in the boat, he can go ahead and take a nap. Go ahead and take a siesta. Jesus isn't scared. Because he's the Lord over those paltry waves. He can use the dad voice on him. <laughs> <laughs> he can he can say, shut your mouth, you silly storm. And you know what he is? He is beckoning you in the storm that you're in. And I, I know all of us are in one kind of storm or another. Those don't stop. That's life. And some of you are in some bad ones. And some of you are in the kind of normal sized ones. But he's beckoning you whatever storm you're in to lie down. And to rest. Some of the best sleep I've ever had in my life was in a tent in a rainstorm. There's something about kind of knowing, okay, the storm is real bad out there, but I'm pretty confident in, in my source of protection here. There's something, I don't know, cozy about that. Something, that, that feeling of protection that's so intimate because the rain's only two feet above your head in that little pup tent, but you know it's strong, you know it's trustworthy. Mm, there's, a, there's a good feeling to that kind of, uh, that you're swaddled in that protection and, and so you feel it more intensely. And, and Jesus is saying, yeah, yeah, come over here. He's reaching out his arms to you and he says, come, come here and I'll, I'll scooch over you. Get, get, get your head on this cushion beside mine and we'll just nap this one out. And if I need to get up and have a word with that storm, I will. I'll use my dad voice on it. But you just come over here and lay down a while. Brothers and sisters, we, we read from Job earlier. I'm, I'm concluding with this today. Um, we read from Job. Um, and at the end of the book, Job, my, he, he was in a storm. Um, his children died. Every penny of worldly wealth he had vanished. His own health deteriorated and he was in great physical pain. He had nothing left. He was literally on an ash heap, scratching the open sores on his body. And, and he cried out to God. And he said, God, this storm is bigger than me. I, it's not just swamping the boat. The boat is sunk and I'm at the bottom of the ocean. And where are you? Why are you asleep at the wheel? Why aren't you helping? And, and God showed up and talked to Job at the end of that book. And he helped Job. He healed Job. He restored Job. He went through the terrible things. I mean, it was still a storm and it was still terrible and he lost everything. 
but God healed the wounds and bound him up and got him going. But he also did something even more important than that. Believe it or not, it's, it's far more important than, than the healing itself, is he spoke with Job. He met with Job. And he met with him in the whirlwind, in the storm. Quite literally, it was a whirlwind that showed up and he, and he spoke to Job. And, and he said to Job, Job, yeah, you're in the storm. Yeah, this ocean is crashing around you, but I'm the one that sets the limits for these things. I use my dad voice on it. And the same God that spoke to Job in that whirlwind took on flesh and became a human being. And he spoke in the whirlwind on the Sea of Galilee to his disciples. And the same God who spoke to Job and who met the disciples on the Sea of Galilee is speaking to you and to me this morning in his word. And he's speaking the same words that he said to Job and that he said differently to the disciples. Who is he? That's what matters. It matters more than the waves. It matters more than the wind. Who God is and his presence with you, that's the defining fact of your moment. And here's who he is. He asks these questions rhetorically. This is a statement about who God is. He is who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the depths. And he, it is he who clothes that sea with clouds and wraps it in thick darkness. Because it is he who locks it behind barred gates and limits it to its shores. He says, God says, this far, you storms shall come and no farther will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is with us in the boat, and we can rest, because this is who he is. Let's pray. God, uh, we're um, in choppy waters, all of us facing COVID and its restrictions, some of us facing financial burdens, some of us battling um, addictions and behaviors that we're ashamed of. Some of us have lost friends and family members, close ones recently. Some of us are scared. Jesus, we're afraid, but we wanna learn how to see it your way. We're afraid, but we want to have faith. And we know that you're here with us. You're in the boat. And even if you're asleep, we know it's only the kind of sleep a seed has as it germinates in the ground. His life, in some his mysterious and hidden way, germinates and bursts forth towards the surface. We're calling on you, Jesus. We are asking you to wake up. <laughs> We're asking for you to help us. We're asking for miracles. We're asking for deliverance. We're asking for help in the midst of trouble. But Lord, we aspire to ask it with the confidence of faith. We aspire to ask it with calm, steady voices, knowing that this storm that we face today will not prevail against us, that not even the gates of hell can win against your kingdom, that you are the Lord over the chaos of our lives, that you are strong, that you are mighty, and that you care, you do care, God, what we face. You care about the wind and the waves. And you will still them when the time comes. We love you, Lord. We cling to you. Help us hear your voice above that roar of wind. Help us to quiet our hearts and to join you in a moment of rest, even as the storm continues around us. We pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen and amen.
you have the chance now to respond um, to God um, in prayer and in worship. And of course, if you want to and are able to give, you can give as always financially. That's one way we respond to God. Although he wants way more important things from us than money. <laughs> um, he wants our hearts and our obedience and our love. He wants our time and our energy. So whatever God is calling out to you today to give to him, and maybe it's as simple as a response of faith, maybe maybe what he's calling out for you to do today or for you to give him is, is to lay down beside him and take some rest. I don't know. I don't know what he's calling for you to give him today, but but we're going to play a, a last song and, and we're going to worship him through it. And, and you can sing along or you can just... You can just do what you need to do in prayer before God with it. Um, let's, uh, let's go before God um, and respond as, as he's calling us to.
king of glory is in the boat with you, brothers and sisters. He made the sea, made this world, made Orion and the Pleiades, and he is not scared, and he does care. He cares more than you can fathom about you and your life. May his voice sound out so that you can hear it clear through the storm and the rain and the wind. And may you hear him calling you to rest in that storm. And may you hear him one day soon call out to silence that storm. But until it is silence, may you know that in it, in the rain and in the wind, you are safe because he, the King of glory, is in the boat with you. Amen. Go in peace and be well.